Last week, we spoke of William, Kin uh, William Carey, uh, the father of modern missions, uh, the man who was convinced uh, that, his, that both he and his fellow Baptists had a real obligation to, to actually go uh, and to make disciples of all the nations. Uh, you'll remember uh, that I told you that uh, in, in the course of presenting this conviction, uh, Kerry met with some fierce resistance. Uh, that one of the senior members of the brigade, the brigade, the audience to whom he was communicating, uh, a pastor of some renown, uh, stood up and, and interrupted him and said, young man, sit down. You're an enthusiast. He said, when God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or mine. Eh. Uh, that man was a little overzealous. Uh, he was anxious to uphold the sovereignty of God. Uh, and yet in, in doing so, he failed to recognize one of the great fundamental truths of redemptive history. It's that when God pleases to do anything, it is rarely ex nihilo. It is rarely out of nothing. When God calls a nation to repentance, when God seeks to save the rebel sinner, he uses human instruments. He uses people like you and I to do so. Thankfully, we understand that Kerry did not accept uh, his predecessor's bad, uh, misguided theology, and, and rather than staying at home, uh, he traveled to, to India and, and spent his life uh, ministering to the people there. And he would inspire thousands to do the same within the, within the 19th century. I mean, you need to understand how significant this was. Virtually, missions virtually was non-existent. Uh, and yet, at this particular point in time in the 19th century, Kerry becomes the crack that, that causes the dam to burst open. Thousands of missionaries would follow his lead. And even today, there are now millions in China and in India, um, in, uh, in Africa, and even in Latin America that can trace their spiritual lineage back to a young Calvinist named William Carey. Yes, God is supreme. God does reign and rule over all. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is, he is intimately involved in every aspect of our conversion from eternity past to eternity future. Make no mistake about that. And yet, being a sovereign God... God uses people to accomplish his predetermined purpose. Open your Bibles with me once again to Romans chapter 10. This morning we're going to pick up where we left off from last, weekend, last week. In the first 13 verses of the chapter, we discovered that because God is sovereign, believers must pray for the unsaved. We must bring those who are dead in their trespasses in sin. We must bring them before the great physician. We must uphold that, that top five list. Uphold them before the throne of grace. Because God is the only one who can give them life. And so we go to him because he is a powerful, powerful Savior. But we recognize that God calls us to do more. Beginning in verse 14, uh, he commands us, God commands us not only to pray, but to preach as well. We can't be passive. We can't stand by. Uh, we must be fishers of men, not simply keepers of the aquarium. And so in verses 14 through 21, God, being a sovereign God, calls believers to preach the gospel to the unsaved. So having said that, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. We'll read Let's begin at verse 13, and then we'll continue reading to the end of the chapter. Paul ended that previous section with that great, that great phrase, that great assurance. 
Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But now comes the questions. Verse 14. How will they call on him in whom they have not heard or have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And, and how will they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. Their voice has gone out into all the earth, their, their words to the ends of the world. Again, he's quoting uh, Psalm 19 there. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? Well, first Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold, and he says, I was found, speaking on God's behalf, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. But as for Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. May he who has ears hear what the Spirit has to say to the church this morning. Let's pray together. Father, this morning I ask that you would speak through me by the power of your Holy Spirit. I ask that you would cause me to be clear and accurate in all that I say and communicate this morning. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, those who have gathered to, to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. Father, I pray that your spirit would minister to them, that you would cause us to be quick to understand, that you would give us a, a softness of, of heart to respond to the truth that is presented, that you would fortify our wills to obey that you would do this so that we might be the people that you have called us to be. And so I ask now that the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts collectively might be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our God, our Redeemer, our Rock. We pray this in Christ's most precious name. Amen. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. You'll remember, I think it's obvious from the title, that uh, Paul wrote his epistle to the, the church in Rome. Uh, this was not a group of believers that he was well acquainted with. Paul had never made uh, a journey to the imperial city, and so these people were strangers to him. They shared a common bond, but they were, you know, he wouldn't recognize them walking on the street. And so Paul, in writing this epistle, I think he does so for really for two reasons. And the first reason is to defend himself in his ministry. Because even though Paul has been very energetic in the spread of the gospel message, it, it, you know, it hasn't been without consequence. I mean, he's gone from place to place. He's gone from synagogue to synagogue, uh, preaching about Jesus Christ, presenting him as the Messiah uh, of the, the entire world. And yet everywhere his go, he goes, his footsteps are dogged by this group of Judaizers, these legalistic Hebrews who, who are seeking to undermine the apostles' ministry, claiming that he has departed from the traditions of the fathers, that he is actually transgressing the law, that he is, uh, you know, he's snubbing his nose at the temple, that he's inaccurate in his handling of the biblical text. And so Paul writes this epistle to, to assure his, his audience, these believers in Rome, that that is not what he is doing at all. He wants to be very clear about this. That's why we see him citing the, the Old Testament time and time again. He wants his readers to understand that he is not saying anything at variance from the Old Testament. 
that the gospel he proclaims points to the Christ, the Messiah that was anticipated by the, by the, uh, the prophets of old. So he writes to defend himself and to defend his ministry. His second purpose, however, is an evangelistic one. Um, what we will discover as we move on through the text uh, is that Paul is going to announce his intention to take the gospel to the yet unreached parts of the world, at least unreached in terms of the, that particular day and age. He, he wants to take the gospel east of Rome, or west of Rome. He wants to take the gospel to Spain. And he writes this epistle to, to then explain the gospel that he's going to take to those people in the hopes that he will garner support from these believers in Rome. He wants them to be partners in that ministry, uh, that they would support him in that work, perhaps financially, perhaps giving him a, a base of operations, perhaps that some would actually go with him and, and seek to, to present the gospel in those uh, farther recesses of the world. And so his teaching, the teaching that he gives us here in Romans 9, 10, and 11, 11 really it, um, it coincides with his overarching purpose. You know, Paul has demonstrated to us in the previous section the, the need for the gospel. He has shown us that man is desperately depraved, that his heart is wicked, that he is unable, incapable, unwilling uh, to, to walk in step with God, that he continually falls short of the righteousness of God rather than embracing it. Mankind rejects it. He makes a God of creation rather than worshiping the creator. Uh, Paul has shown us what happens when the gospel is embraced, that when a person puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are justified in God's sight. They are declared not guilty because Christ has taken their sin upon himself and then taken his work, the work which he offered on Calvary's cross, and he has imputed that to their account. So that when God looks upon them, he sees them as he sees his own perfect sinless son. Now, however, he shows us how the gospel is applied to elect sinners. He shows us that God is the prime mover that God exercises his free choice in selecting those who will experience his mercy. But that sovereignty does not mitigate human responsibility. That doesn't mean that we can sit back on the sidelines and rest easy. It means that we are to be an active participant in his wondrous work. And so we are to pray and we are to preach. Because God is sovereign, believers must pre preach to the lost. That idea is conveyed in two parts in the section that is before us. The first division is found in verses 14 through 17. And then there Paul describes the, the conduct that is expected of the believer. Then in verses 18 through 21, Paul gives the second division and there he expresses a word of caution. Uh, so let's begin uh, with the conduct that is expected. I, I've been actually deliberate in that choice of wording. I, I did wrestle with, you know, what are kind of the main headings of the text? How do you word them? Uh, and originally I thought, you know, this is the command, you know, the command to evangelize the lost. That, that's what it should be. But as we go through the text, you'll notice there's no command. There's no imperative in the text. And, and I don't think that's because Paul is overlooking that fact. I think he, he believes that this is this is most apparent to his readers. I mean, you can't be a believer for five seconds without understanding you are called to, to proclaim the same message that was proclaimed to you. That if you are truly thankful and joyful for the work that God has done in your life, you cannot keep it to yourself. This is a, an artisanal well that continues to, to boil over. 
And so that's why I, I think it's expected. Uh, it's, it's known, it's understood that this should be what we as believers are doing. And so in verses 14 through 17, believers must recognize, they must recognize that the preaching of the gospel is a necessary part of God's saving work. It's necessary and therefore expected. So let's begin reading again at verse 14. Paul says, How then will they call on him whom they have not, in whom they have not believed? I, again, I think it's probably important for us here to pause and to remember that Paul is presenting this instruction in, in a specific context. Uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11 were written to address a particular question. The question was this, if, if God or, or if Israel is God's chosen people, then what's going on? Why is it that they are not coming to a knowledge of the truth? Why do they seem to be falling away in greater numbers? Is it then that the word of God has somehow failed? So Paul, when he refers to they in this particular section, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, he is referring to the unbelieving uh, Israelite. He is referring to the physical descendants of Abraham who have refused to acknowledge Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we need to, we need to keep that in mind because Paul is, is going to refer to other nations in the latter part of the text. And so he's making a clear distinction between two particular people groups. And that is going to come to the fore, particularly as we move into chapter 11. But having said that, even though Paul's instruction deals with this particular situation, there are some general principles that we can apply at large, apply more generally in mind. So keeping that in mind, this is what we read. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent, just as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Now, to quote a past U.S. president, you really don't have to be a rocket surgeon to understand what Paul is doing here. Uh, it, in some ways, is self-explanatory. He is making, he is, he is giving us a, a list of rhetorical questions that the, the response to is so self-evident, you, you don't have to even give the response. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? They can't. How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? Not going to happen. How will they hear without a preacher? Well, that's impossible. How will they preach unless they are sent? It's a non-starter. So Paul, is what, what he is doing here is he is simply outlining, at least from a human perspective, the normal progression of activities that leads to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody is, is born into the faith. And no one is saved because of where they are born. Christianity is not a, a hereditary trait that is automatically passed from one generation to the next. You can't catch it by engaging in a certain religious activity. Spurgeon said it well. He said, faith cannot be washed into us by immersion, nor sprinkled on us in in christening. Uh, it is not to be poured into us from a chalice, not generated in us by a consecrated piece of bread. There is no magic about it. He said it comes by hearing the word of God and by that way only. According to the Apostle Paul, a man who is being directed by the Holy Spirit to write what he writes, he tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. If someone is going to call on the name of the Lord and be saved, they first have to hear and believe the gospel message. They need a herald, someone who will come and preach the word to them. It's the picture of the herald that lies behind 
the word that Paul uses in this particular text. Uh, it's the word keruso. It means to preach, to proclaim, or to herald. Uh, and this imagery would have been well, well known to the believers living in Rome because Rome was filled with heralds. This was a company of men who were specifically commissioned by uh, the Roman government uh, to carry its, its missives to the far reaches of the empire. These men would be given a specific message to declare, a message that had to be memorized word for word. They would carry that message into the various cities and into the various uh, town squares, and they would cup their hands together and they would say, Hear ye, hear ye. Uh, Rome has, has conquered the land of Parthia. It has added a new territory to the empire. Give glory, give honor to mighty Rome. Uh, they would say, hear ye, hear ye. Uh, Caesar has, has produced an heir. There is a son, uh, a, a, an heir who is going to occupy the throne. Hear ye, hear ye, hear the edict of your king. These messengers were not free to ad lib, uh, to improvise on the message. Uh, they were not given the opportunity to, you know, to, to add their own personal insights, to give some color commentary, just to, you know, give the communication a little flair. No, they had to repeat the message word from word for word from place to place. Because when they went back to Rome, they had to give a report of their message. They had to tell the, their supervisors exactly what they said to the people. And if they deviated, even slightly, their life was on the line. Believers are called to act in a similar fashion. They are called to proclaim the word of Christ. It is a very specific message. It's a message that focuses on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is not your testimony. The gospel is not your good works. It's not an act of philanthropy. The gospel focuses on Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity. That he is the eternal son of God who took on human flesh, being born of a virgin. Uh, it presents him as the one who lived a sinless life, preaching and teaching others about the kingdom of God. A one who called listeners to, to put their faith and trust in him. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even if he dies. The gospel tells us that, that Jesus went to the cross as the sinner's substitute, that he offered himself willingly at Calvary to pay a debt that we could never afford, that he died to satisfy the wrath of God on behalf of those who put their trust in him. The gospel tells us that on the third day, Christ rose from the grave proving the reality of who he was. He left the tomb, appeared to people over a course of 40 days, demonstrating that he accomplished all that his father had sent him to accomplish. That's the message that must be heralded, the message that must be preached and proclaimed. And make no mistake about it, if people are to come to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they must be told who he is, and what he has done. At its very core, the gospel witness is a verbal witness. It's a verbal witness. I appreciate the words of Kenneth Boa and William uh, Crudenier who highlight this issue. They write these words. They write, since no other media except the human voice was of practical value in spreading the gospel in the first century, but preaching is Paul's method of choice. I would expand that a little. Preaching is God's method of choice. 
uh, his method that goes far beyond first century AD, uh, a method, method, method that goes far as far back as Noah himself. And yet, they write, in the media-rich day in which we minister, has anything replaced preaching as the most effective way to communicate the gospel? We thank God for the printed page and even for cutting-edge presentations of the gospel circling the globe on the internet. But it is still the voice that cracks with passion, the human eye that wells with tears of gratitude, the human frame that shuffles to the podium bent from a lifetime of service to the gospel that reaches the needy heart most effectively. Hearing may not require preaching today, but it always benefits of it. It's always strengthened by it. So what about us? I mean, who's responsible to, to disseminate this information? Uh, to whom is the, off, uh, the apostle referring when he speaks of those who have beautiful bunions, beautiful feet? Is he pointing to pastors? Is he pointing to missionaries and evangelists, those who are sent? Is he pointing to the body of Christ as a whole? Well, the answer is yes. Yes to preachers. Yes to missionaries. Yes to each and every believer within the church. We are all commissioned to go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And while there are some who are gifted uh, more than others, some who are called to a particular form uh, of ministry, we think of the, the Stevens and the Pauls, we think of the, the Carries and, and the Taylors. The reality is that all of us have been called to witness within our own respective spheres of influence, that regardless of our, our position. We're all called to let our lights shine in, in such a way that others hear the gospel proclaimed, that they see our good works, that they glorify our Father in heaven. Now, Hudson Taylor told of a Chinese pastor who really instructed converts to begin sharing the gospel as soon as possible. There's no idea of a waiting period, an incubation period. Uh, for this man. No, he wanted his people to, to share the gospel as soon as possible. And so once upon meeting a, a young con convert, the pastor said, brother, how long have you been saved? And the man responded, you know what, it really hasn't been long, uh, that he had been saved for less than three months. So the pastor asked, and how many have you won to the Savior? Oh, I'm, I'm only a learner. Uh, the convert replied. Well, shaking his head in disapproval, the pastor responded, young man, he said, the Lord has not called you to be a full-fledged preacher. He has simply called you to be a faithful witness. And then he asked, he said, tell me, when does a candle begin to shine? When it's almost half burnt up? When it's a long way down the process? No, said the young believer, it begins to shine when it is first lit. That's right, said the pastor, and so let your sh light shine right away. Don't wait, don't stop, don't sit back. So how about you? With whom have you shared the gospel message over the past month or the past three months, the past half year? Remember, this calling is not reserved for a select few. It's not given just to the twelve, but to every disciple, to everyone who takes on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to, to go to Bible college. You don't have to have a master's degree before you open your mouth. Because the reality is we're simply declaring a message that we have already believed. You may not be as polished as you like to be, and that's okay because things will get better with time and with practice. You may not have the answer to every objection. You shouldn't be expected to. 
Not only that, but you exist within a community of believers. Uh, You live amongst brothers and sisters who can give you advice and counsel. What you need to do is to preach the word of Christ. You need to be looking for those verbal off-ramps to share the message of the gospel. When someone is, is... downcast, struggling with life, uh, to use that as an opportunity to, to show that individual where you find safety and security. That it's not in the possessions that you own. Uh, that it's not your confidence in, in the people around you, but in the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you on Calvary's cross. Yes, use tracks. Uh, point them to an article online. I invite them to church or, or to, to come to youth group from time to time. But always give a follow-up. Always seek to explain the gospel message to them clearly so that they understand what it means. Be verbal. Pray for them and then preach to them. Be a herald because the preaching of the gospel is a necessary part of God's saving work. As we move into the last four verses of our passage, Paul expresses a word of caution. He wants his readers to be realistic. He understands that while the preaching of the gospel is a necessary part of God's saving work, it is not an easy part of that saving work. I mean, how good would it have been had Paul ended at verse 17? I mean, let's end on a high note. Uh, Let's look forward to this grand presentation of the gospel, uh, seeing people being saved, converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, left, right, and center. But Paul doesn't operate that way. He's not a man who walks around with his head stuck in the clouds. He's a man who has traveled those long, dusty roads. He is very well aware of the difficulties and the dangers that are going to confront these people. He understands better than most that not everyone who hears the message will respond in faith and repentance. He knows that many, if not most, will resist. So in order to keep his audience from being shell-shocked as they begin to herald the truth, Paul Paul points them to the experience of his fellow Israelites in verses 18 through 21. These verses reveal something of the hardness of the human heart. They demonstrate the the importance of God's sovereign hand in bringing the the rebellious sinner to a, a saving knowledge of his son. Because left to themselves, mankind never responds favorably. They respond at least in three different kinds of ways. None of them are hopeful. First, we see that some people will simply refuse to hear a message that has been clearly communicated. That's what we find happening in verse 18. Paul here is answering a series of of objections. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed, they have. Their voice, the voice of the message has has gone out into all the world or into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Once again, Paul is citing Psalm 19. Paul contends that no Israelite living in the first century could really claim not to have heard or or to have access to the gospel message. It had been clearly uh, disseminated, so much so that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the the Pharisees, they got down and dirty. Witnessing his his popularity, the the widespread influence of Jesus' teaching, it was then that they hatched their murderous plot to put him down. They had to take drastic measures. Why? Because this is their own words. The world has gone after him. They had heard the message. 
It had been clearly communicated from one end of the country to another. It went from city to city. It had been presented in houses and in courtrooms. It was proclaimed to the rich and the poor, to kings and beggars. And no unbelieving Israelite could claim ignorance. They heard of Jesus of Nazareth. His conduct had not been re relegated to some sort of shadowy corner, some subversive activity, you know, kept from public sight. No, Jesus was out in the open. He spoke plainly. He never muttered. He never stuttered concerning who he was or why he came. The reality is these people simply refused to hear and obey the gospel. Well, in the next two verses, Paul anticipates a second objection. Maybe the Israelites heard the message. They just didn't understand it. Maybe it's not a question of access, but apprehension. That's really the essence of verses 19 and 20. Notice how Paul answers this objection. Notice how he draws a distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles. But I say, surely Israel did not know. This is the idea to perceive. They're saying that you know they, they weren't able to connect the dots. Were they? Well, he responds now by citing Moses. I will make you a jealous, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. And Isaiah is very bold, and he says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. I mean, understand the contrast that is being made here. The Jews were educated. They were the spiritual elite of the day. They were well-versed in the biblical text. Their sons and daughters received an, a religious education. They, they understood their, their ABCs from the Old Testament text. They were taught to memorize the Scriptures, so much so that they would memorize large portions, if not entire books of the Bible, sections of the Bible. Those who were particularly adept at this, at the age of 12 or 13, were ushered into the rabbinical schools so that they could become the scribes and the teachers of the people. I mean, these people were not ignorant of spiritual matters. And yet notice what is happening in, in the text. God is made known. He's made manifest. He's understood by a people who are not a nation. I mean, that is the Jewish term for the Gentile people. You're not a nation. I mean, you're so disorganized. You're such a, a, a ragtag band of warring tribes that you just can't get your act together. I mean, come on. At least be a people. Have something in common with one another. Spiritually speaking, the, the, the Gentiles were considered to be barbarians. Just going after one false deity after another. And yet, who is it that's turning to Christ? The Jews more and more are rejecting their Messiah. But it is these Gentiles, these people who are not a nation, who get it. These people who do not have the Old Testament text. The people who have not been ministered to by scores of prophets. Who are not the recipients of the oracles or the covenants of God. These people, now in city after city after city, are coming to faith in Christ. Greeks and Romans and Gauls and Parthians. All types. What made them different? The Jews wouldn't receive it because they were hard. 
when Galileo was summoned before the Roman Inquisition for teaching that the earth revolved around the sun rather than the sun around the earth, he was charged with heresy, a, you know, a great crime against the church. And even as he was charged, he offered to demonstrate the truth of his finding by having the council look through a telescope. He wanted to th them to see what he saw, but they refused. Their minds had already been made up. They would not consider evidence to the contrary. And with the same obstinacy, Israel, from the New Testament times even to our present day, has refused to consider the claims of the gospel. It's not that the evidence hasn't been presented. The truth concerning who Christ is and what he has done has been put on public display. But it's understood. Not by the Hebrews but by the untaught, a nation without understanding. The problem was not a lack of knowledge. It's that the Jews just didn't like what was being said. They rejected a message that was clearly understood. That's why they did not accept it. Last, we'll see that there's one more objection, one more note that is brought to the fore. It's not that the Jews hadn't been, hadn't been told. It's not that they had not known. It's not even that they had missed the message. These people rebuffed a message that had been repeatedly given. Look at verse 21. But as for Israel, he, this is Isaiah speaking, speaking on God's behalf, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Just one, one note here. Paul is actually quoted from three different sections of the Old Testament text. He's quoted from the Psalms. He's quoted from the law, Moses. He's now quoting from the prophets. Each and every section of the Old Testament text is proclaiming the same message. Paul is not cherry-picking. He's showing that the hardness of people's heart is at the very crux of the matter, and that this is not an incidental doctrine. The problem is the hardness of the human heart, that people refuse a message that is repeatedly given by God. A message that he communicates all day long. Day after day, month after month, season after season. We know people like that, don't we? I mean, they're friends and family members. People that we you know, share dinner with every Easter and, and Christmas. Those times where... You know, we may go to church together and, and hear, you know, a message on the incarnation or, or a message on Christ's death and resurrection. We may read those passages at home during our, our gatherings together. And yet these people, whoever they may be, they just, they just will not submit. They won't bow the knee to Christ. They get angry when we refer to these texts. It's because of the hardness of the human heart. That just undergirds for us the need to, to again approach the throne of grace, interceding on behalf of these people, to plead with our sovereign God to draw these individuals to themselves. We've seen it happen. I mean, Paul was the last person the world would ever think would turn to Jesus Christ. The last. The man who is still breathing out murderous threats against the church is converted while on the, the, the road to Damascus, while he is seeking to, to kill off the church of Jesus Christ. He was not looking for a savior in any way, shape, or form. 
And yet God interceded and brought this man to himself. We see the same thing happening uh, in, in Acts chapter 18. Sosthenes is the ruler of the synagogue in Corinth. He goes on behalf of, of the Jewish people and he, he seeks to make their, their, their case to, to Gallio, the, uh, the, uh, the governor of the area. But he is unsuccessful. He is unable to argue his case. It, it, he's un, are, unable to compete with the Apostle Paul. But I mean, he is a fierce opponent. A fierce opponent. What a wonder it is to read his name listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Or Paul writes, along with Sosthenes, our brother, to the people in Corinth. It's not that, not that Sosthenes has just become a believer. No, he's an evangelist now working side by side with the Apostle Paul. Yes, the human heart, it's hard. It's diamond tough. It's titanium strong. But our God is stronger than all. And so we pray and we preach. The story is told of a little girl who asked her father why the firemen stayed in the fire hall spending their time polishing the engines and looking after their equipment. And the man, I mean, he's not giving the fullest of explanations or whatnot, but he explained to his, his dear child that they did this to pass the time uh, while waiting for a call. Well, many Christians act in a similar fashion. They stay close in the familiar surroundings within the church communi community, applying another coat of, of worship or, or getting a, a theological tune-up waiting, believing that on some off occasion, a sinner is going to request a gospel presentation. But the problem is apparent. I mean, because the reality is this, that the world is already ablaze. The alarm has already gone out. It was issued 2,000 years ago. And so what the sinner needs is not some... New, beautiful, well-tuned truck. What they need is an, an intrepid group of firefighters who will brave the heat. Who will brave the dangers in order to deliver a life-saving message. The question, brothers and sisters, is will you be that person? Will you trust in the sovereignty of God praying for these people, and then seeking to communicate the gospel message, recognizing that the presentation of the gospel is a necessary part of his saving work, even though it's not an easy part of that saving work. Will you be such a person? Let's bow together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of Scripture. We thank you that this particular text was written by a man who exemplifies your great work in his life. The hardest, darkest heart being pierced through by the, by the light of your radiance. A man who is fighting against your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking to destroy his church is brought to saving faith, becoming the great apostle to the Gentiles. Truly, you are a great and mighty God. A God who is able to melt the hardest heart. A God who is able to give us strength to persevere, to give us a love and a passion for the lost. And we ask that you would do that for us today. Father, that we would not be slack in our obligations, but Father, that we would be frequently, fervently seeking those opportunities to share the gospel message with those around us. And Father, as we do that, we pray that we might rejoice, 
that we may glorify you as we see these people come to a saving knowledge of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Do we have a closing hymn? No, we don't. Let's, uh, let's conclude then with a benediction from Hebrews chapter 13. Paul writes, or sorry, the writer to the Hebrews, I think it's Paul, he writes this. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, may he equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for coming, brothers and sisters. We'll see you again next week.